All right, girl, we're going to arm wrestle. Arm wrestle? Why would you get dismissed from it? Okay. The power lifter, track and field star athlete that you are. Are you, are you going to let me win? A few moments later. One, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war. It is the most woodsy bourbon I've ever I don't know had. If I'd hate that though. Like I might I actually, actually enjoy, enjoy it. it. All right. Okay, Mary Kate and Ashley. So I have like my basket of like get the hell out of here, and then I have flowers from my dad. It's like love you lots. Like just walking. <laughs> also like Valentine's Day. <laughs> it was a mess. You said your dad said figure it out. Yeah. When I'm listening to this, I'm like okay. That's a crossroads in Patrice's life. Mm. If dad would have rescued you, do you think you would have kind of instilled those values of survival as much as you did? Mm, good question. I actually never really told anyone this. I mean, my friends know. When I had gotten laid off and went through those tough times in my 20s, I just remembered. Welcome to the Barbells and Bourbon podcast, the podcast that allows real people to tell real <laughs> stories. I am your big, bald, bearded, barbell lift and bourbon drinking son of a bitch, Sean. <laughs> and joining me today is Patrice Thompson. Hello. Welcome to our home, Patrice. Thank you for having me. Big deal for me. Thank you. You said you're a little nervous. I am. Is it because of all this? It's like all of this. And then I've watched a couple episodes. I'm like, oh, all right. I mean, we're legit. This is it. <laughs> like this is welcome. it. Like we're we're legit. So welcome. no, thank yeah. you. But seriously, welcome to our home. Um, you did say that you felt like it's a big deal to be welcome to somebody's home. We've known each other for ten minutes. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. It's a very um, safe space for you and your family. You know, like I said earlier, it's very vulnerable when you allow someone in your home. Um, the energy, like. I'm big on energy, so mm -hmm. when we were on the phone and we were talking, just getting to know each other, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna do this. This is going to be good. So I stepped out of my comfort zone, and I appreciate you allowing me in your space. Well, I appreciate you coming and being vulnerable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and being brave, because this is a big deal. The whole world could see this. Yeah. You yeah, know? I didn't Not think about that. Nervous. Yeah, I didn't think about that until uh, just now. So, <laughs> But listen, this is just us talking. These cameras and these lights are going to disappear. I promise you. So I'll take it, you on that. It's just just us now, Patrice. If someone clicked on this video to watch it, mm. and they made it this far, mm. what's something that you want the viewer to take out of our conversation? I feel like we're going to get into just like my journey, and I would say that it's about just not giving up on yourself and don't count yourself out. A lot of things in my life that I've done, I've either you know was the first or overcame a lot. And I had to become my biggest cheerleader. So I think that, you know, if you're struggling with should I do something, shouldn't I do something, you know, have faith in yourself that you can. You can get through it. I love that. Mm -hmm. And you are my 35th guest. Yes. And every single person that sits in that seat is super interesting. Mm -hmm. And almost every single one of them say, I'm not very interesting. Why do you want to talk to me? Yeah. And you kind of did too. Yeah. Like. <laughs> but your life is normal to you because it's your life. Valid. You know? Yeah. So you're going to be talking to me and people are going to be resonating with some of the things that you're talking about and relate to some of the things you're talking about. And they're going to be motivated, inspired. You're going to help somebody today. And I thank you for that. Oh, thank you for, you know, again, giving me the space, giving me the mic. The energy thank you <laughs> you're welcome i like your vibes too so this is going to be a good time um so typically i like to kind of take a step back in time mm. you're sitting in that seat you've become the woman you are because of past experiences from people influencing you mm. from your childhood your parents friends yeah. whatever right so i kind of want to step back and do like a scrapbook and oh, see what okay. patrice's life has been like so first wow. where did you grow up <laughs> I grew up in Westmoreland County, so uh, home of Spartans. I went to Hempfield. The neighboring county. Yeah, uh, Plum, we played you guys. <laughs> Were we good? Probably not back then, but <laughs> yes. Um, but originally from North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, Charlotte. When did you move here? As a kid. Summers were in Charlotte and you know, grew up here, went to school here. My whole life kind of Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Yeah. Did you grow up in a traditional home with a mom and a dad? Very much. Yeah. So mom, dad, brother. 
Um, yeah, we were, we were normal, but uh, not as normal, I think, as people think. My brother was in the military. Um, my, I've had a stepdad. That's my father since I was uh, two years old. Um, very big family on both sides. So my mom, my dad's side, my mom's side has all women. We have no boys. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> so like, but um, yeah, I would say traditional. Yeah. You know, fun Westmoreland County. You know, I I say I'm like suburban, but yet country. Like yeah. fish. You know, like we go in quads, but I can also be very city. I mean, whatever you want. Well, Tomboy here and there. Oh, absolutely. Growing up, yeah. I mean, I had brothers. Like my mom adopted. You know, um, a couple of my brothers. So house was always busy. House was always you know moving. It's fun time. So you were the only girl. Uh, yeah. Okay. What was only that girl. like? Um, I know how to fight. <laughs> you can scrap <laughs> and I win. With the rest <laughs> um, it was fun. It was. It was fun. I always felt very protected. But it's funny because I really was like the main like adult. So they were all older than me. Um, but I was like the most mature one. Of you were them like all. mother hen. Absolutely. Like sit down. Stop doing that. Um. Yeah. So what? What made you act like that? Like where did you get that from? I am my mother's daughter. I hate to say that. Ugh, I hate to say that, but I am my mother's daughter. So you got very that much from like mom. mom. Yeah, yeah, very much. What was your relationship like with your parents? Oh, they're my best friends. Yeah. I think I'm truly blessed. My parents are my best friends, for sure. Um, I'm a daddy's girl, though. My dad, my dad, my dad. I would do anything for my dad. Um, very close with my grandparents when they were alive. So both sets are gone. But yeah, I grew up in a very... Um, Southern Baptist, um, but wild, crazy. We still like to have fun, like, you know, but, yeah. you know, very traditional, I would say. I would say. How much of the South did you bring North with you as far as, because I know, like, Baptist is the yeah. South, right? Yeah. I would say there's a lot of things that I do that some people up North are like, huh. Like, a uh, perfect example is I was at dinner with a couple friends. I had to go to headquarters for work. And he started whistling at the table. And I was like, oh my God. And he was like, what? I was like, you can't whistle at the table. And he was like, I've never heard of that. And uh, later on in the week, I had went to dinner again with those same people and a couple other people. And two girls were from North Carolina. And I was telling them the story. And they're like, yeah, you can't whistle at the table. And I think like the etiquette is a little different. And um, the food, like how we like eat is a little different. Um, just mannerisms. Okay. For sure. Things are more proper in the South? Um, yeah. I guess you could say that. Yeah. A little proper. And then I, like family style meals and... I think the family style is the same. Okay. I think it's just what you serve at the dinner table. Because family's family. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we, we love to hate each other. Like, <laughs> like, I think that's anywhere you go, you're going to love to hate each other. But yeah, I would say it was. it's really like the mannerisms, maybe some of the etiquette, things that you do, things you don't do. Yeah. How has your relationship with your parents changed over the years from being a kid till now an adult? Oh, child. <laughs> I have a 66 and 67 twins. I have children. Like, my parents were strict, 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 and I love them for it. I would never change my, my upbringing. I think when I was young, I was like, oh, they're so strict. And I look at the things that I've done in my life and the accomplishments that I have and the opportunities, and I'm very thankful. But now, at uh, 33 years old, I have a 66 and a 67 uh, set of twins, and every day it's a challenge. <laughs> every day it's a challenge. That's I mean, so funny. my mom's my best friend, um, and then my dad is like, I don't know, even know how to explain. It. Like my dad is just, he's like, I don't know, he's like my dad. He's my dad, but he's like my best friend too. Like yeah. he's like, the dynamics have shifted completely, which is very, I think it's different. At 33. Yeah. I, my, I mean, my relationship with my, my parents has grown into more of a friendship, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah, when you're a kid, it's like, guys, come on, like, yeah, lighten it. up a little bit, yeah. right? But I think the strictness, if that's even a word, I think that's coming from protection, right? They're trying to oh, protect yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you can tell a child every day, you know, just wait until you grow up. You'll see why I treated you like this. And at the time, you're like, oh, whatever. But yeah. as an adult, it's just like, okay, I get it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's where I first started, like understanding like how to always follow through 
you don't quit. Do what you have to do to get through like that strictness. If we're gonna, because we're gonna make it a word today. Strictness is a word. Ash if it's not, yeah, strictness. strictness. I don't know if it is. If it isn't, let us know. But um, <laughs> I think that that's why my parents. Um, you know, they really drilled that into me. And I think it has its pros and its cons, but sure, yeah. I think if you're overly strict, and I've had a few guests who did come from a house of an extreme disciplinary. Yeah. Mother and father, when they left the nest, they went wow, ape shit, right? Yeah. They're like, I'm free. Mm -hmm. Rains are off. Let's go wild. So I think yeah. there's a, a balance there. Yeah. I think my mom was more strict and my dad was kind of like, ah, just don't mess it up. Like, I'll always be, I'll always ride for you. Ask your mother. Like, <laughs> I always try to like slide one in. But I will say that I can't give like all my parents credit because my aunts were like a huge impact. Like I have an aunt that like would be like, oh, let her go to the teen club. Like, it's all right. Let her go. And my mom would be like, all right. You know, like, uh. so, you know, got to love the aunts. Got to yeah. love the uncles. But yeah, parents are, my parents really are my best friends. I love that. Love them. What was school like for you? Oh, you enjoy so, it? Um, High school? You would start there? Or like Wherever. Yeah. Like wherever you can like kind of remember where it actually made an impact on you or anything that stands out. I would say high school was rough. Um, I went to Hemfield, so a lot of people don't look like me that went to Hemfield. So high school was definitely rough, but, um, it built me to being able to handle a lot of things. And I learned a lot of things. I learned how to, you know, control emotion. I learned how to survive and be different. You're speaking race, right? Well, yeah. You know, yeah. being, just being a black woman in yeah. Westmoreland County, but I learned. And then I also got to learn how to, who my champions were. Because at the end of the day, like, I still, you know, all my friends, they look like you. And that was fine. And I'm some of my best friends till this day, 30 years down the line. But I learned how to just overcome adversity. I learned, like, you know, what a friend is, how true a friend will go that line to make sure you're protected. Um, and the upbringing, very, like, just, like, good people. There are really good people in Westmoreland County. <laughs> um, yeah. I absolutely yeah. um, love Hemfield, love Greensburg area. So... I would say high school, that's what I learned. And then I took that to college. Um, and that was a complete like switch. Cause when I went to college, it was kind of like everyone, like everybody you Melting can imagine. Pot. Melt, yeah, like, so that, I think it set me up for success. And I would say like my school, like academics, for sure, I was ahead of the game. So I can, you know, I'm always happy about that. Um, but I got to experience things in college. I think that helped me become who I am now, like I joined a sorority and I was on the track and field team and, you know, I did a lot of public speaking and I was coaching. So I definitely got like a mix of things that I was missing maybe in high school. I got that in college and my master's, I took that to my master's into another master's degree after that. So Dang. I'm a Pittsburgh girl. Like I've, I've done all of my education for sure in Pittsburgh and I, I love it. So you mentioned track and field. Did you play sports in high school as well? I did. Yeah. yeah volleyball. Um, track and field, shot with discus, um, went to college, um, held the record for hammer weight, um, did shot put, um, I was lifter, big lifter. Um, yeah. You're a badass. Full ride. Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. What college? I went to Cal U. Okay. Yeah. So Roger Kingdom was my coach at that time. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I loved it. So other than, you know, sports and college, you said you were in a sorority. What was college life like for you? I had a ball. Yeah. I had a ball. But again, that was a moment where I realized, like, you have to push yourself. Like, I was in high school and it was like, my mom like, get up, go to school. Don't forget this. And like, I always went to practice and do what I had to do. But when I got to college, it was like, oh, they're paying for school. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I can get kicked out of school. Oh, okay. So college was fun, though. Um, I met amazing people, people that still to this day helped me out, um, had helped me when I, you know, went through some hard times, like in grad, in that grad school to like your professional start of your career. Um, my sorority, absolutely love everything about it. I have sisters for life and, you know, we do things and we travel together. So for me, I think college just expand, expanded, excuse me, my, you know, my friendship circle. Am I, you know, just having yeah. fun. So you said hard times as far as what? So when I got done with grad school, I was like, I had got laid off. So I was working while I was in grad school. I got laid off. And like, that was the first time. I think it was like 23. 
I just moved out, like, in my apartment. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm not asking my parents for anything. Though they would do anything for me, I'm like, I'm an adult. I chose to move out. I chose to do all these things. And, like, my dad would always tell me, you know, you have to stand tall on your own. You got to figure that out. I'm always going to help you. But, like, if you can do it, do it until you can't, like, until you break. Figure it out. And um, I was, I was, like, working at a daycare. Like, um, one of my mom's friends out in Greensburg, let me work in her daycare. Um, I was working at a bakery for a little bit at the same time. Um, and then at that moment, that's when I kind of started like drinking a little bit more. Cause I got laid off. Like, so I'm, you're stressed. like I'm stressed. Yeah. Um, and then a friend of mine actually like reached out from college and was like, hey, apply for this job. And it was at, like a really good university. And I was like, I'm never gonna get this job. And um, had two interviews, got the job, and like in a matter of like four months, like God just turned it around, and I got back on my feet. And I would say that that's when like boom, it was. I just took flight, and my career just started. So yeah, that's amazing. So you said your dad said, "Figure it out." Yeah. When I'm listening to this, I'm like, okay, that's a crossroads in Patrice's life. Mm. If Dad would have rescued you. Do you think you would have kind of instilled those values of survival as much as you did? Mm, good question. I would say that I would have still been able to handle the adversity, but I think that I would have kept messing up. I think I would have, I think I would have you know, I'm like, all right. Because uh. the risk doesn't have the same consequences if you're rescued Correct. from it, right? Correct. I think I would have definitely... I would have dabbled around and still kept making like poor choices. And, you know, I'd probably still been partying more. I'd been drinking again and, you know, just doing the things that get out of jail free. Get oh, out of jail absolutely. Free, right? You know, and I, I, you know, it, he, it was that moment. Like he was tough love. Cause my dad was never the one, you know, that was like the tough love. Like, Oh, you need it here. Um, and that moment I was like, Oh, he's serious. Like, it's like, I need to, I need to figure it out. And I did, but I've always figured things out. But in that moment, it was like, what am I gonna do? Like, Have you ever thought about that moment up until this point? Like what oh, that yeah. kind of meant yeah. to your future? Yeah. Every time I hit a milestone in my life or an accomplishment that I never thought that I could accomplish or I was going to hit or a pinnacle in my life, I think about that. Yeah. Along with other things that get me there, but I do, I think about that moment. I think about when my mom was like, <clears throat> excuse me, she was like, I will, like she would like try to like slide me money and I'd be like, I'm good. I think about the moments where I'm like, I picked myself up. Cause a lot of people think it's really, it's really easy for me. A lot of people don't know, you know, like I struggled. It looks really good on the outside, but like there's a lot of like dark nights that, you know, before I got to like my professional career and, you know, athletics and, and like the bodybuilding stuff, God, like that's like, that's once I finally figured it out and I was like, all right. Yeah. yeah I think it's okay to get like a life preserver thrown to you mm -hmm. here and there, but especially with this younger generation. I think kids today are entitled. Yeah. They feel entitled. Yeah. Um, they want to be handed everything. I agree. Um, not even so much the kids, but just society. Everything's instant gratification. No one wants to hold account to take accountability for Absolutely. anything. It's Absolutely. disturbing. Right. Absolutely. And if, and if you keep getting those free passes, what are you going to learn? Nothing. And then you crumble. Like if you don't know how to pick yourself up, off of like one inconvenience, you're no good for anybody. Like you're gonna crumble. Like mm -hmm. it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be a lesson that's gonna drive you. Like for me, it's like I love a challenge. I love someone to say you can't do it. I love to have something thrown in my face to be like, okay, how am I gonna get out of this hole? Because it's mental. Like if I can mentally tell myself you can do this, then I know that anything else that's coming down the line, it's gonna be better than where I was at. And I think if you, you look at things and you look at life like that, to be entitled to me, I have no, I have no desire for that. Like, I just want to work hard. And I like you, to be around hardworking people. You, you have know? no sense of pride either. No, you have nothing you stand for. Right. Yeah. And it's okay to fail. I think failing is the best thing in the world. I think failing is why I am where I am. I think I've failed so many times on things. Um, you respect what you have once you fail. Like, if you're good at everything, 
uh, I can't listen to anything you say because you're good at so, everything. So, yeah, like, we can't, yeah, re- like, can't relate to that. I can't relate to you. Yeah. But when you fail and you keep going and you pick yourself up and you try it again and you try it again and then eventually you get it, it's like, oh, that's a story I want to hear. It's yeah. a humbling beginning. I want to hear that. And that's why you're sitting there, Patrice, oh. is because <laughs> people are going to be able to relate to you. Oh, I hope so. Because you're not one of those influencers that have millions and billions of dollars and followers and no. sitting pretty and having everything done for them. And I don't relate to those people, Patrice. I don't know no. about you. I definitely don't. Actually, <laughs> they kind of annoy me. <laughs> exactly. Like, I love to showcase, you know, things on my social media and I love to, you know, you know, put things on social media to showcase working out or like, you know, motivation. But like, at no point is it for hundreds Loading. and thousands of people. Right. Like, I don't post something to be like, oh, this is going to go viral. Like, it's like, oh, this is how I feel today. Yeah. And I hope that it, like, touches somebody that's in that situation. You know, being yeah. authentic is something that I take, like, a pride on. Like, I feel like you always need to be authentic and genuine. Um, people feel that. And um, that's who I trust. Those are the people I want to sit in rooms and, you know, work with personally and professionally. Like, if you're not authentic and you're not genuine, I don't, I don't want to trust you with anything. Yep. And this is the authentic you. Very You're not much. reading from a script. No. I didn't like say, okay, Patrice, <laughs> we're going to start talking about this. And then we're going to talk about this. You and did then, it. You I'm, gave me I nothing. I want you to say, <laughs> like, okay. come on, man, help me out. I'm like, you gave me a couple questions. You did. But I'm like, oh, yeah. what are we going to talk about? But, but no, authentic me. Because I mean, like, I'm a Pittsburgh girl, Steeler jersey, you know. Yeah, you're like, do you mind if I wear my jersey? Yeah, it's opening night. Like, Come like as that. you are. I love that. Because yep. that's one thing you're going to get from me. I'm always going to be me, baby. <laughs> well, we're uh, 22 minutes in, and oh. I've, gotten, I've gotten all of you so far. Um, so what did you go to college for? You mm. said you got a free ride. What was it, What I was did. your major? Sports management, and then um, with marketing. So that was my undergrad degree. I really thought I was going to be a sports agent. Like, I thought I was going to, like, sign the next LeBron. Really? And then they were like, oh, yeah, you have to go to law school. And I was like, ah. Thanks. <laughs> Just because of how much school it was? How much school. And I really thought to myself, like, was that what I wanted to do for the rest of my life? Um, and I was like, well, I still have the business background. And then that's when I went to grad school. And I got, like, a degree in business um, management. And then went back to school and got another degree in leadership. Where did you go for your master's? Point Park and then CMU. CMU. Yeah, I did this program where they like ch- chose like the top 25 emerging leaders. And then you got to go to school through the Tepper Business School. And uh, yeah, it was pretty dope. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. So what was your first job out of college? <laughs> uh, let me take it back. I worked as a marketing coordinator for Westmoreland County hospitals within the nursing home systems. So I worked in the nursing homes. I did physical therapy. I was the physical therapist coordinator first, then like moved up and had nothing to do with any of my degrees. But again, a friend reached out and was like, hey, I'll be good at this and you need a job. And I was like, okay. And um, that's where I, ju- that's when I had first moved out. And I will never forget on Valentine's day, they laid me off <laughs> and my dad had just sent me flowers and she calls me into the office and she's like, we're going to have to lay you off. So I'm walking out. <laughs> with, you got a congratulations. You got off. laid off. Yeah, I got like my bag. To, like, they're like, you need to leave. I'm like, okay. So I have like my basket of like, get the hell out of here. And then I have flowers from my dad that's like, love you lots. Like, just walking out. So like Valentine's Day. It was a mess. Oh, talking about an emotional roller coaster, huh? Yeah, that's all. Every time someone asks me about my first job, I always that is the story I go to. Like, I don't remember is, anything else but that. That's not, I mean, it's not funny, but it's funny. It's hilarious. <laughs> Looking back on it now, because my bills are paid, it's hilarious. <laughs> like, so you said your first job had nothing to do with the degree that you had. No, no. Mine didn't either. No. How did that make you feel about college? Well, at first, I was like, it's a scam. I hate it. And then I realized that now. I would say I realized that it was just a stepping stone to like many opportunities because I think around like 25, I had this thing where it's like, just don't say no to any opportunity. And I think that was the first start of me just taking a leap on faith. Like, well, we'll see. And I actually have met people that I've helped years down the line um, working at that job. Like 
I've needed something and this, you know, a gentleman was like, hey, I remember you helped me walk. I got into a serious motorcycle accident, like, and you were there and you would cheer me on every day and you would make me laugh. And he came and like put a barn door in for me. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even remember that. Like, but that was my first job. And it was something that I would have never expected, but I did it. And um, it built connections and it built networks. And I think if anything, that job was a part of my degree. My degree was to work with people. Yeah. And that was a part of it. How good does it feel to get feedback like that, that you changed somebody's life? It's scary. I think it's scary sometimes. I didn't I, expect you to say that. Yeah, like, because you're <laughs> Elaborate. like. Elaborate. Yeah, like, it, it gets scary sometimes because you're like, oh, like, people are like, oh, thank you so much. And you're like, well, everyone should want to do that. And I think sometimes people will thank you and they, like, have this negative expectation of, like, in the beginning. And then at the end, they're like, oh, thank you so much. Like, you did this and you did that. And you're like, I'm sitting there thinking, like, well, shouldn't everybody want to help people? Like, even though it's my job, like, if I was there visiting someone and I saw you struggling, I'd be like, let's go, like, let's go, like, get it. So it's scary to you because it doesn't happen as often yes. as you think it should. It doesn't, it's, yeah. that's just wild to me. I mean, does it make me feel good? Yes. I think if anything, it's not about me when I get that feedback. It's like to see the quality of their life yeah. afterwards. You're like, wow, like I remember, like you were literally a vegetable in a wheelchair at one point. Sorry if that wasn't like politically correct. It's okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, you know, you were, you know, you weren't able, to, you weren't physically able. And now you're walking, you have a business, you're doing like, that's Thriving. amazing to me. Yeah. Like it had nothing to do with me. Again, you did it. You got up every day. You were your biggest cheerleader. I was just there like, listen, I'm not about to stop today. We don't got up already. Okay. Like it's Full circle moment. Number one, right yeah, there. Yeah. Like, biggest you know, cheerleader. <laughs> he was his biggest cheerleader. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. I, um. I enjoyed that job though. Good. Yeah. So you're unemployed for how long? Oh, I was almost unemployed for a year. Yeah. Was that was that scary? Yes. Yeah. But I had a lot of faith, and I again just made it work. Like I found a job, and I I would do anything. Like I have like my pride at that moment. I think that was the biggest lesson. Like because I was making good money then. You know, I was in my twenties. I was traveling. I was doing what I wanted. It was humble. It humbled me, and then. Um, it also made me see that like you don't have to be in positions of power to make impact. Um, Cause when I was unemployed, I was at a daycare. And now I see the kids that I was at a day, I, you know, raised in the daycare, they're like grown adults. They're like in college. And I'm like, oh my God. Makes you feel old, <laughs> yeah, huh? Yeah, makes it, yeah, I'm seasoned. We're seasoned. Okay, we're, we're not gonna seasoned. say the old word. We're not gonna say old. Um, but it, it's, it was amazing, definitely. Um, Back to, being unemployed, were you mad? Were you ever like angry at that company for letting you go? Or were you just like, okay, this just wasn't for me? Mm -hmm. I think now where I sit in my position, I would say, oh, it just wasn't for me. Then I was probably furious. Yeah. I'm sure I was furious. I think if anything, it was more the embarrassment of like, oh, I lost my job. And walking out with your- Yeah, walking out with my <laughs> flowers from my dad, like, yeah, you rock kid. And then like a box and like, you're like, it'll never happen to me. Like, I never in my life would think I would have got laid off. Like, back then, I'm like, I'm going to be here forever. I'm just going to move up in the company. Laid off. <laughs> so after a year of unemployment, mm -hmm. what job did you find next? Oh, I In then, your career. In my career, I did. I landed that job. A friend of mine helped me. I ended up working at Duquesne University. And I was working in their sports and athletics area, like, in their department. Um, did that for about a year and some. And um, a friend of mine calls me. Like, hey, like you interested in working for like television? And I'm like, ah. again, another person that made a connection throughout my life. Um, she's like, I think you have a great skill set. So I'm like, okay, WQED PBS. I'm like, oh, this is a big girl job. At that time, I, I'm like, this is a big girl yeah. job, right? Um, and I went and worked there. I was um, the manager of like sponsorship, like corporate sponsorship and like, I got to work on you know, television projects and, you know, work with education and do all these great things. Like, you know, it was Mr. Rogers. Like, it was great. Like, I remember when I got the job, my mom was like so excited. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I remember she was like, take a picture of her in the sign. I still have that picture of the first day I worked at WQED. Did you ever meet him? No, he was, he had passed by the time. Oh. But I did like the sweater and like his wife. I did get to meet his wife at that, at, at that time. Yeah. Um, she was Amazing, sweet as pie, just like him, I'm sure, yeah. from what we see and what I saw on television. Um, 
yeah, so then I was at WPD, closed the deal with the FCC, um, and then I got a call, another call. Someone was like, hey, I think you'd be good at this job. And I'm like, ah, and I did not apply for it for quite some time. And then someone called me and I then worked at the Allegheny Conference. And it was with like the Chamber of Commerce and the Pittsburgh Economy League for Pennsylvania and the Regional Alliance. And I started off as a manager there. And I was like, oof. Like at that time, I was like, this is a good salary. Like at that, you know, this is this is great. And um, within like seven months, I ended up becoming the director. So I was the director of investor relations for Western Pennsylvania. So you climbed that ladder quick. Yeah. Again, though, I was like, I'm not going to stay a manager. Like, I was like, absolutely not. Like, no, like, I'm done. Like, I'm, I'm going to move up and, <clears throat> excuse me, everything I could. I connected, I engaged, and that's where my network built. That's where it started in Pittsburgh. So you say network. You've said network a few times. How important is your network? Very. Every single person that I meet, like, you're in my network, but every single person that I meet, it is a genuine and intentional relationship. Because I feel that every person that I meet um, there's a reason. Like right now, it's the podcast that we're on. Yeah. But five years from now, when you're blow, you blow up and you have a studio and you know we might see you on when we see you on TV. Screw <laughs> that. When we speak it into existence, That's right. you know, who knows? Maybe I'm the person that helps you get a corporate sponsorship. Like you just, you never know. Like it's just the beginning. So I always say that my network and your network is so important because it takes you places. Like if I need a job. You know, I, I don't I don't have a spirit of fear because I know there's somebody. It might not be the salary that I, I want, but I have I have that position to call people. Um, I always have a, a sense of friend or family with your network because they become your friends. You know, it starts off professional, but it becomes friends. So for me, when I'm coaching kids and, you know, doing public speaking, I'm always like, treat your network like your family because you never know what you're going to need out of it. You that's That's huge because... And your network is an extension of who you are. Hundred percent. If you were walking around hating the world, being negative, be you. criticizing, like your network is going to look like that too. Hundred valid, valid, and that's why I tell people it has to be authentic. It has to be genuine. Like I don't want to be with anyone that's transactional, you know. And you know those people, and that's great. But I wouldn't, you know, they're I engage with them. They're not in my network. I engage with you because it's transactional. Yeah. You know, so all of these right. doors that have been open for you says a lot about you. Like if you were a bitch, who's going to help you? Nobody. <laughs> right. And I'm sure there's moments that I have been, but I mean, there, you know, but yeah, I have a, I very much want to treat people, you know, nice. Like I think there's, you know, sometimes you might have to put your foot down and have that conversation. And, you know, some people take that criticism negatively, but in my life, my mother and my father and my, you know, my grandparents and the people that I was raised with, like, you treat everybody the same. You know, you, when you go to a job, when I walk into my office, I speak to every security, good morning, the barista, good morning. Like, you know, you never know, like, you never know who I could one day, you know, God forbid, lose my job. And I might have to go work at the, the Starbucks in my building. Yeah. And that barista that I say hi to every morning that I give the same respect that I give my boss could hire me. You know? Another thing <laughs> along those same lines of as far as like just acknowledging people on yes. a day to day, you could be saving their life. 100%. I said hi to a kid at the gym yesterday. He looks like a lion. Mm. Legit. Really? Reddish blonde, long hair, mm. and then the beard to just, match. He yeah. looks like a freaking lion. And I walked up to him and I was like, bro. Your look is incredible. Like I, I love what is going on here. Right. Little he was like, he's like, bro, well, look at you. You you look like a bad like. Yeah. And the person I was training was like, you could have just saved his life. I was just like, you could have. I didn't think that at all, but I'm just like, you, you never know. You don't know. You have no idea just that one interaction and that one interaction what it turns into. Um, yeah, that's how a lot of things in my life. It's just talking to people. Hi. Even when someone looks like they don't want to say hi, I'll say hi. You know, I have that conversation. I'll talk to anybody. Yeah, my previous guest, Audie, um, the episode before you, she told me mm -hmm. during our discussion that I saved her life. And she had never told me that before. Literally. Amazing. And I was just like, I was like holding back tears because right. it's like you don't expect that. But be kind, people. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And I think, too, like to your point, because being a trainer, coaches and, and trainers and mentors, they are life saving because nine times out of ten, when we reach out to them, you're at your breaking point or you're in need. Yep. And, um, you know, I just I try my hardest. Like, I'm sure you do, too. You just try your hardest to give without depleting, but to give. And even if that give is just a simple high, yeah. I'll do whatever I can. Yeah. And you mentioned trainer. Yeah. In fact, most people that sit in that seat are people that I've reached out to, but mm. every once in a while, I'll have a guest sitting there because someone <laughs> has recommended them. Okay. And your coach, Brian. Good old Brian Borks. Thank you, buddy. I love him. He we love to hate each other. <laughs> in the as gym. most in coach, the gym. coach clients do. But yeah, he reached out to me and was like, hey, you should oh. talk to Patrice. She's got a really interesting story. She's a hard worker. She's a badass. Mm. Just appreciate ask her. It. So I appreciate it. Thank him. you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, he's turned into um, a serious friend, like family. Comes to the cookouts, like he's, you know, my mom and dad love him, sisters so love him, like everyone. He is, he's truly just a um, phenomenal person um, and believed in me. Yeah. And that, that mattered to me. I think that's much. the one of the primary jobs of most coaches is just mm -hmm. to believe in that client. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's sometimes that's all you need. That's it. I just, you know, and he's like, you can do it. We'll do it. And uh, we did it. We're still doing it. <laughs> we'll talk about a little more detail about your yeah. bodybuilding journey. Yeah. <laughs> so Love when it. you got your job um, at the Allegheny conference, Con yeah. is that where you're working now? No. Yeah. So, so I you left moved there. on and on and on. Yeah. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. You got to switch it up. Yeah. So I actually moved from there because I did economic development and um, a little bit of, uh, you know, politics with that. Uh, environmental science and stuff and moved to uh, construction yeah, yeah what do you know about construction Not Patrice a damn thing <laughs> um, <laughs> but I will say this that industry embraced me a hundred percent so I work in um, community and citizenship so like community development community planning um, subcontractors so you know if you are you know veteran owned women owned minority owned LGBTQIA plus owned local business and you subcontractor, email me, turn to construction. Um, so do you, what do you offer grants? Like how does that? We like packages, bid packages. You can, you know, bidding and getting you in our system to be able to bid on jobs. You know, we're commercial construction. So every little piece of the project gets built. So you're allowing the small fish to play in yes, the big pond. Have to. That's I a passion that. of mine is to make sure that folks that are within, you know, our region, within our communities have opportunities. Um, and that's what I advocate for at work, along with a colleague. That's what I advocate for. Good stuff. Yeah. So that's what you're doing today. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it's rewarding to a different level of some of your past jobs, right? Yeah, for sure. Cause you're seeing the impact. Like I'm like seeing the businesses grow. I'm seeing the people I'm building those relationships with those folks. And it's beautiful. So do these small businesses, like do you keep in contact with them after the fact? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like if there's an opportunity on a job or something and I'm seeing it and I'm having that conversation, you know, with folks in the room, Oh, what about this company? Oh yeah. Why don't we bring them in and you know, get them on a project. Some of them have gotten huge, you know, contracts and, just that little bit again of just they believe in their themselves and then they reach out to me or I'm reaching out to them and we make it work and you know we just we keep pushing. What's the most project. fulfilling opportunity that you've had so far? If you had to kind of rank one out of my jobs, as far as with your current job, the opportunity that you provided to somebody, what's something that kind of stands out? There was a woman-owned business that was just kind of getting started and we were looking for a bid like a bid for a minority woman-owned you know like mwbe business um and they're like oh we just can't find anyone that that does that and i'm thinking i'm sitting i'm like oh and um she came to mind reached out to her got a meeting set up got her you know together with the unions um i love my unions by the way um and um she got the she got the contract like she's she's on the project she's on a huge project too and um you know i love that i think another rewarding piece is just being able to interact with the unions and learning about the trades and getting to really meet folks within the trades and having conversations with you know the guys and the the girls 
um, within construction. It's very hard industry to get into. Um, not a lot of people that look like me, for one. And then to have just being embraced, like women in general in construction, then a black woman in construction, you don't see that. So to have people that are embracing, oh, come on, you know, and teaching me things and, you know, of all walks of life, of all races, you know, of everything, embracing me has been amazing. And I'm, I'm truly humbled and honored, you know, to, to work beside a lot of these people and to learn their trades and, and, you know, what they do day to day. How often are you putting the hard hat on? Oh, I got the I got the PPE in the trunk. <laughs> you got it already. I got there. it already. I got an got aviation hard hat. Yeah, I got the I got the toes. I got the, the the cut six gloves. Like I got the aviation hard hat. I got the regular hard hat. Like, whatever you want. Got the boots. You never know. And you gotta get on a site. I'm ready. Uh, I'm all about that PPE. <laughs> I used to work for power plants essentially. Oh yeah. So I've been on fifty different sites mm. in the country. So and those are tough. I'm ones. all about that PPE. Listen, you gotta keep the PPE. <laughs> It, it's it's life saving. Personal protective equipment. <laughs> Boom. So I was like, "What the hell is this PPE?" PPE you're talking about. <laughs> it's not OPP. No. Totally different. <laughs> yeah, it's it's life saving. It um, is literally. But yeah, I have it. I, I will put it on, and I have no problem. I enjoy that part yeah. of my job. Like yeah. truly enjoy it. I get made fun of because my boots aren't dirty enough, but they know I'm a little you know a little princess sometimes <laughs> out there. Clean them. You clean In between them, like, sites. You know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, girl. I want to talk about fitness. Oh. But first, can I interest you in some supplements? Absolutely. So I did ask you, <laughs> and you actually, no, you came out and you was like, you know, I really don't drink. Yeah. Is there a specific reason why? Yeah. I actually never really told you on this. I mean, my friends know. So I'm going to share this. Is um, When I had gotten laid off and went through those tough times in my 20s, I just remember drinking a lot. And then... I realized that my drinking was like my weight gain. Like once you're done with like track and you're done with a sport in college, like you don't have the three practices a day. You don't have people dropping food off to you. You don't have the meals ready. And I just saw a spiral. I was drinking a lot of, drinking like a gallon of wine a day at one point. I did. I remember. That was when I knew. I had drank like a box wine and I was like, okay. <laughs> like This might be a problem. This might be a problem. And, you know, I definitely like, got it under control and you know and just like again supported myself like you don't need to do this cold turkey and was like we're done and then um just really looking at your you're looking at your family background like you know a lot of people like you know were drinking in my family um and i just didn't want to be like that and i wanted to stay like youthful yeah. um so yeah and then my you know just wanted to wanted to lose the weight get back to like my college self and that was drinking. And then bodybuilding came later in life. And it was like, well, I can't, you know? Yeah. Well, good for you for recognizing it yeah. and making that change. I never told anyone that. Yeah. Well, you just told You guys are lucky. You just told a shit ton of people. I did. I just told a lot of people I drank. I drank a lot of wine. I was a wino. I was. Yeah. Loved it. And I just want any, any guest who comes on this show, there's no requirement to drink any of that mm -hmm. bourbon that's behind us. Um, it's beautiful, though. It, I mean, it is. It really is. This one. This one. Devil's Juice number five. So Aubrey <laughs> Warwick picked that one. Kevin Sass picked that one. So I mean, it's like right here in the name. It is. Like, I mean, the name alone. And it just so happens to be sitting like right by you. If I did drink, I'm not going to lie. I'd probably do the Devil's Juice number five. Uh, <laughs> that would be interesting to witness. I, I'll smell it. Can I smell it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. What's that smell like? Um, it's giving me a little woodsy. Am I? Am I? A lot of woodsy. But there's still like a hint of like a, a sweetness to it. Yeah. Hmm. So that is extremely strong as far as the proof goes. It's over 120 proof. Oh lord. It's actually distilled in Sewickley by really? McLaughlin. It's a local distiller. Oh. They actually come out with some pretty local. It is local. Support, Support your local. local. Yeah, girl. <laughs> uh, right on cue. Um, but so you said woodsy. Yeah. I know you're not going to taste it. I know, but if I were to describe that to you, mm -hmm. it tastes like you're licking a burnt piece of firewood. It is the most woodsy bourbon I've ever I don't had. Know if I'd hate that though. Like I might I actually, actually enjoy, enjoy it. All right. Okay, Mary Kate and Ashley. Is there is there a teleprompter? I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's 
it's the vibe. It's oh the God. vibe. Seriously. I would enjoy that though. Yeah, I, I do. I enjoy it. Takes um, me back to like s'mores. Anytime mm. I think of like firewood, I'm like, it's cozy. Like, it come cozy. on, fall, bring it on. Devil's juice. Devil's cozy. Juice. <laughs> said no one ever. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> okay. So since you're not going to be drinking, we're going to have some Project One nutrition supplements. Ooh, it's my first time trying Project One. I am on their squad. Um, discount code BTC10 for 10% off if you're interested. Now, I have some electrolytes. I have some collagen, aminos, pre-workout, and a test booster, which you're not getting. Yeah, no, I'm good with that. But I'm the aminos are right up my alley. Yeah. So this is the blue raspberry. Ooh. I love how raspberry is spelled with a P. How do you say it? Raspberry. Raspberry, not ra like I've heard people you say, say like, raspberry. I've heard, I've heard it. I don't. That's psycho. Yeah, I'm, it's 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 like when you say salmon or salmon, and I really. Ooh. You can't come. People, who says salmon? People do. Are they just joking? I, I would hope, but like I mean, they say it. Salmon. Uh, salmon. Comment I mean. below. Do you say <laughs> raspberry and or, salmon? Yeah. Or do you say it the right way? If you do, it's diabolical. All right. So <laughs> like, pour a little water in there. All right. So we're actually drinking some supplements out of. My own custom cocktail oh. glasses. They're beautiful. Because we're classy. Bottles. Classy. Classy broad. <laughs> well, I mean, you do you have the pink nails to match the pink lights. That's yeah. classy. I, that's my favorite color. It's bubbly. All right. Oh. I'm going to froth you up. Talk about classy. Oh, my. There, there's going to be a head on this Listen. class of aminos. If the mics pick this up, I'm sorry. It's got to be annoying. That's crazy. At least they know it's in real time. <laughs> so aminos are good. Pre-workout, post-workout, mm -hmm. intra-workout, anytime. All right, girl. Tell me what you think. Cheers. Cheers. I like it. The wrap's look very... At the, look at the head on that. Come on now. All right, fitness. Fitness. So the first time I saw you, I've actually seen you prior to today, mm -hmm. was in the gym. Yes. Oh. Lifting some heavy ass weight. Was I smiling or was I angry? Because I've been told my face can give off like an intense. That's a good question. Yeah. Like, I don't I don't really. No? Well, you didn't give an impression that, oh, she's a bitch. Or you didn't have good, like RBF good, that. Good, good. You know, resting bitch face. Yeah. No. That can happen sometimes. I mean, you're, look, when someone's at the gym doing their thing. I don't judge them for there. their attitude in that Love moment. That. Love it. You know, they're they're you're there to put work in. You're not there to make friends. Mm -hmm. Right? Some people are. No, no. But not there. Yeah, I would never judge you because you look like you were being serious or okay. off-putting because yeah. that's kind of your job when you're in the gym. I like that. You know, the job description in there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you were lifting some weight, and I'm like, all right. She's she means business. So like where where did I know you ran track and field, mm -hmm. but when did the kind of bodybuilding weightlifting thing start? Weightlifting started in like high school. I had a track coach that believed in like weightlifting. So in high school I was hang hang cleaning and deadlifting like two, three hundred pounds then. Yeah, like I was squatting three, four hundred pounds, band workouts, chains. Um lifting with the boys like all of us like so you know as a thrower we weren't like what your stereotypical throwers were like you know dave murray at hemfield has probably one of the most recognized throwers in pa so he took his team serious so i was always lifting benching and then when i got to college those numbers skyrocketed because we had like actual like coaches so you know like I was true strength coaches true strength coaches yeah, yeah. So when did the bodybuilding thing come into play? Because it sounded like you have more of like a powerlifting background. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, bodybuilding came when I it was like twenty eight, and I always thought about it, and I was like, oh, it'll never happen. It's not gonna happen. COVID hit, and I lost a lot of weight running and just doing whatever you can, like you know, during that time, that unfortunate time. And um, I started working out, and I thought to myself, like one day I'll do it. I'm gonna do it one day and then I put it out of my mind because I'm like, oh, 
I'm never going to be able to follow that diet. I'm never going to be able to do that. So that's why you said it'll never happen. Yeah. Because you didn't think you'd be able to put the work in and the discipline. I didn't think in my mind that I could do it. Like I wasn't supporting myself. Like I wasn't telling myself I could do it. And then I met like a friend at that moment in my life where she was a bodybuilder. And she was encouraging. She was like, you can do it. Like, you'd be great at it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, that's a lot of work. And then um, that's when she hooked me up with my coach. And he was like, let's just give it a trial. Try, like a trial. Like, yeah. and, you know, we worked out a couple months together and then did a cut. I was like, all right. And then he was like, you would do this? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And at that moment, he was like, no, nah, you're going to do it. Like, if you know Brian, like, he's kind of like, mm, there's no, there's no, like, maybe. you're going to do it. And then, uh. We went, we went hard and I, I did it and we got to the, I say the big show because to me the Pittsburgh was a big show um, and I was shocked. I was shocked at the, uh, you know, I won my class. You know, I, I swept actually in all my classes and took second overall and I had a lot of people that helped me though, um, but I never thought I could do it then. But I, again, having someone say you can do it and then I supported myself and I was like, I can do it. and having someone believe in me. Cause I mean, he was there. He was, you know, every day you're, you're not eating, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. Um, yeah. So bodybuilding was, it was something, it was something. It really is something. And for those who aren't in the bodybuilding or know nothing about bodybuilding, it's probably the most discipline based mind fuck sports that there are. Yeah. Um, you go from, you know, kind of eating whatever you want and then you, you start your prep and then all of a sudden, all of those delicious things that you used to have are off the table, literally. Yeah. Um, meal timing has to be spot on. You're weighing your food, you're mm -hmm. eating in the most inconvenient times of the day. Spaces. Spaces. <laughs> Temperatures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're eating your food cold. Yeah. Uh, lukewarm car heated up. Like, yeah, it's not, it's not glamorous. It's not fun and it's not supposed to be fun, mm -mm. but you're transforming your body day by day. And that is what is fun. It's seeing oh, yeah. that, seeing that change. Yeah. You swept all of your classes in your first show. How did that make you feel? I mean, I was excited, Yeah. but we didn't win. Well, yeah. So, so you didn't win the overall. I didn't win the overall. So to you, that's like winning. Yeah, that's that to me. But um, yeah. I actually didn't even think I would place like the top five. So um, I was really excited. I was. I was really excited because a lot of people put um, work in to help me get there. You know, like not just like, you know, my coach, but there was like Adam from Alliance Athletic and then Dougie Flex and Paige Sabitra and – um. My own therapist and like my gym at LA Fitness in Monroeville. Like, I mean, my God, those people were every day, like just seeing me go through hell and my friends and my family. So um, I always joke, like, it's a, just a big win for like, again, like my people. So I was yeah. very excited. So you mentioned very familiar names to me. Mm -hmm. So Paige was a guest. Yes, that's my, my posing coach. Yeah. Love her. If you so need posing, she's my posing consultant for yes. all of my clients. Same, like, yeah. the posing consultant she's the best she is um dougie i'm trying to get him on here but he's been so busy with traveling and his own shows yeah he's doing it and then adam's gonna be coming on too yes i literally before i came here i was there yeah <laughs> that made me mad but <laughs> like my back what, what, did, what did you get done um i had cupping done um deep tissue so i haven't had one since the show mm. <clears throat> and i like hit him up and he was busy, but he was like, Brian, you know, he can, he can help you out. So two amazing people at his, you know, shop. Um, but I needed some serious, like detailed work yeah. and I feel it. So I think there's a lot of bodybuilders that don't realize the maintenance that your body needs. You know, it's not all about like losing the fat or building no. the muscle. You have to stay mobile. You have to stay, you got to keep the, the blood flowing in those muscles. Like there's a lot of maintenance behind the scenes. I think as like a first timer, because I'm still learning and I'm like always taking things from like people and just, you know, I feel like I have a really experienced like group of people around me. Um, that was like the main thing was like recovery and, you know, understanding like what you do off season and on season. So I'm still so new. 
There's certain things like I won't even speak on because I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like I call my coach still or, you know, I'll ask, I'll ask somebody else like that I, you know, rely on. But I will say that recovery was something that um, my coach and I took really serious and I learned and, and Adam was a huge help with that. Like, Hey, you got to get the deep tissue. You have really thick muscles in your quads. Like your quads have to show, we got to break that up. So I'm learning still. And I think that's what I, I love about the sport. Like, when you think you know, you're learning something new from multiple people, which is yeah. which is good. Now, another thing about bodybuilding is you never know who you're going to be standing next to on stage that day, and that, what they're going to look like. So it's just like wracking. What did they do to get to that point? Did they check oh, every yeah. box possible, and did you do that? Nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. Like I remember walking backstage, everybody's like derobed, and I'm my coach is like, keep it on. Yep. And I'm just back there. I'm like, well, you know, like keep it on. And um, yeah, it was a very, kind of a very humbling. humbling, but like, you're just like, yeah. Like, and um, I think that moment, you know, I fell in love with it and I aspire, you know, to get to some of the, the, the peaks that folks that I've mentioned, I aspire to get there um, in due time. So this is part of your life now? Yeah. I, I don't think like, I don't know, like, I don't think you can really fully get out of it. Like, unless you started it for, like, a, I don't know, more of, like, an aesthetic reason. But it's, like, even how I eat still and how I, you know, I go to the gym every day. And I train every day. And I see my coach on Sundays. And we go through the plan. And we do this. And it's a part of my life. It doesn't control my life. But it's it, I've made it a priority for me. It's a part of my mental health to just keep me on the straight and narrow. And it's for me. Yeah. Because nobody else can really do it. I can name all those people. But if I miss the meal, if I don't go, if I don't do it, like you said, I got back there and I'm like, okay, did I do everything? Am I happy? And I would say that I was happy with the package for my first show. I was very happy with it. And that's all you can control is yeah. what you did. Mm -hmm. You can't right. control who you're standing next to, what they're going to look like, the work they put in, their genetics. Nothing. Nothing. No. And the girls are really nice. I, I, was, I was worried about that. Like, or, you know, girls were nice. I'm still a competitor. So it was kind of like, you know, Got it. not too much. Like, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but I enjoyed every bit of it and hope to you know, keep going and getting ready, you know, for some things. And, you know, want to be like those, those Dougies and, you know, yeah. those pages of the world and get out there and get on some bigger stages one day. Besides obviously changing your body, what did bodybuilding change for you? It changed me on my thought process. I think a lot of times, like, I'm like, I can do this, I can do that, but like, I've always had team built or I've had someone help or, you know, like collaboration. Like, I did it, but like, I've had other people. Whereas with bodybuilding, like, if I mess up, it's on me. Where in track and field, like, if I, if I lose a point, someone else might pick it up and triple jump or, you know, but in bodybuilding, it's like, oh, I'm not losing the weight because I'm doing something and having the accountability. That accountability is so different. And it's like, you can't get mad at anyone but yourself. You want to get mad at your coach. Like you do, like you're I'm like, oh, fuck you, Brian. But like, I know that I took the extra scoop of peanut butter and I'm just going to look at the camera because when he watches this, he's going to be like, yeah, I know. I took that extra two, four scoops. But um, <laughs> yeah, you're like, I know, I know I did. I did it. I did it. But um, it, it really, truly, um, it helps you take an, an examination of yourself. Yeah. And I think it had prepared me for the next journey of my life, mentally, physically, spiritually, um, even professionally. Like walking into a room and like people are like, wow. Like it's just a different type of interaction. Um, Spiritually, like there were times I was ready to break, you know, during prep and I held it together outside in front of people. But this was my first time. Like, you know, other people have done it before, like my first time. Yeah. I'm like, I'm reading the Bible, you know, I'm reverting back to like prayer, you know, because you're hungry. Like I never experienced, Sean, like hunger. Like <laughs> I, I will, like when people are like, I'm starving, I literally snap my neck like, no, you're not. Oh, that's and like I, the most annoying when you're on prep to hear someone say, I'm so hungry. It's just you. You're work. not. And even then I think I think about like, okay, on prep saying I'm hungry. And then I think about what does someone feel like in another country 
that's probably eating less than the three chicken breasts and whatever I'm eating per day on like the lowest deficit that I can be on. Yeah. So like, you're right. Like, you hear someone say you're starving. You're like, you don't even know. Perspective. It just changed. It changed me. And it gave me a, a respect for those people that are in the gym every day. And like when I see the pros or I see someone doing it, like now, like I'll spot someone and you're like, oh, they're in prep. Yeah. And I'll just walk over because people did that to me. And again, I'm new. I'm, this is this is new to me, but I encourage them. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It it was. I enjoyed it. Like I look forward to my next prep. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the discipline. I enjoyed that six months of vanishing. I think I the did. structure is sort of comforting in a way too. Mm. You know, it's Never like it's like, it like you, you know what's coming next. It's you have everything's under your control for that amount of time. And I think for me anyway, structure and having that control is, it is very comforting. That's a, you know what? I never looked at it like that. Maybe that is why I like it so much. It's that comfort of knowing like the next meal's coming or no, I can't do that because I have something here that I'm, I have to focus on. Yeah. Um, Cause for me, I don't know about you, but like for me, it was never the workouts. It was always the diet. Yeah. I realized that I had FOMO too. Um, bodybuilding really showed me that I didn't have boundaries with certain people doing certain things. Mm. Like social events. Yeah. Like going out, I had to go out and not have a drink. Like I didn't, I don't drink like, but I would have like a glass of, I don't know, like champagne sure. or, you know, or I'd take a, you know, I'd have like, couldn't do that. And, like the whole perspective of just everything, like, it changed like the boundaries change or certain people I'm not friends with anymore after yeah. my prep, because yeah. I'm like, you don't fit into my life. So, you know, what's interesting about that is, and I think, you know, bodybuilding is a very extreme sport, mm -hmm. but I think if you're just trying to lose weight, yeah, I think the foundation is the same. The, the things that are required mm -hmm. of you are the same. Yeah. Maybe not to the same extreme, but you still need to make sacrifices. If you want to lose 40 pounds <laughs> in a year, yeah. you need to stop doing what everybody else is doing. Correct. When you're going out with your friends, you can't live the way they live because you no. have different goals now. No. But do you want to anymore though? Because you see uh, a part of your life where you're like, oh, that's where I was when I was doing that. And it didn't work. Like whatever I was doing then didn't work. And it's like, now I look at myself, let me put myself to not speak on others, but like myself in where I'm at now when I did it, like I disciplined myself to lose that, like you said, to get the weight to where now, like I'm meeting new people that align with my life to where I don't want to go do those things. Have your friend circles changed? Yeah. 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 My core friends have always known that fitness, regardless of bodybuilding, has always been a part of my life. They're going to support you no matter what. No matter what. Yeah. I have a friend of 31 years and I'm 33 years old. We are fourth generation friends. Um, but I've met some amazing people. Um, you know, going out with people now and being able to go somewhere and not feel pressure to drink or someone saying, eat this, eat this, eat this. And it's like, they get it. Like, that in itself or hey why don't we go to the gym and go get smoothies or something or go get a, a, a you know a protein shake after and like that's that's cool like to me like and some people might think that's weird but like to me it's like that aligns with my life that is lunch that is fun for me um and then i've lost some friends i talk a lot about friend circles on this podcast and the older you get i think your friend circles tighten mm -hmm. because um you know, we talked earlier about your network. Yeah. You know, your network is like, show me your network and I'll show you who your friends are. Yeah. Right. And it's the same way with your friends. Like you show me your friends and I can kind of pinpoint the type of person you are. hundred percent. Right. I love that. And if Greg Rudolph made a really good analogy when he was on, mm -hmm. he said, you put a rotten peach in a bowl full of fresh peaches. The next day, the whole bowl is going to be rotten. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think you need to be careful who you allow into your life to a deep level because they could poison you yeah. without you really even realizing it's happening. Mm. Right. doesn't mean you're not friends with them. No. But you can't let them kind of control what your path is and what means the most to you. Like 
you know, your true friends aren't going to say, Patrice, come on, come out, have a drink. Why aren't no. you drinking? Eat this. Like, what's wrong with you? Mm. Is that really a true friend? No. Right. No, you're right. I mean, and friend circles are so important, especially during that time for me. So the friends I lost, I'm like, okay, they were there for a reason. They were there for a season. That's fine. But I think about the friends that I had during it where they're, hey, we'll just come over and we'll, we'll eat meal prep with you. Like that to me, the support um, was amazing. Um, but I think I, it's going to sound crazy. I think I became friends with myself again during prep. How do you mean? Um, I learned to be able to be with myself and watch movies and find fun for myself and find enjoyment in the pain because prep was pain to me. You know, I enjoyed going out. I'm a social person. So I would go to events for work and I couldn't eat. I'm eating in the car, but I had friends that would know that, or they'd be like, Hey, like we're going to save your seat, take your time and eat your meal prep in the car and then come into the event. Like I found out how to be a better friend to myself, to be kinder to myself. Um, and just to enjoy my own company because for six months, damn near, I was, I had people, but I was by myself in something that I've never done before. It was very unfamiliar. So like now when someone says, do you love yourself? Yes. There's caveats to that. Sure. But do I love myself? Yes. Do I enjoy the company of myself? Yes. Because I had that time to friend myself. I've never thought of that. That's yeah. so important though. It that is. you're comfortable with yourself and you can, you could be comfortable spending time alone yeah. and not hating that person that you're looking in the mirror mm -hmm. at, you know? I mean, there is a flaws that sure. you see as a, you know, as a bodybuilder and you look and you're like, Oh, I wish this and oh. this and this and this. And Pick you know, you're never, you'll be, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. you still do, I still do it. Yeah. But what I can say about me inside internally is I love myself because I'm like, Oh, like I know when I annoy myself, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I know me now to where the physical, okay, I can change that. But friending myself and loving myself has made every relationship better. Um, and I'm very thankful for that through my journey. I have a lot to learn, but I, I mean, when it comes to bodybuilding, that's what it did for me. Yeah. Bodybuilding is, and if you're not in the bodybuilding, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I'm not sorry because, you know, it changed me. You know, Changed I did a life. seven month prep and oh, man. it was my first show. That was my turning 40 goal, right? Okay. I ate 1,000 meals on time, perfectly weighed, yeah. didn't cheat once, never missed a meal. That's satisfaction though. And I was a natty. So I was up on stage in the NPC with mm -hmm. enhanced people that yeah. outsized me by 30 pounds. But I didn't care because I knew I did everything I possibly could to get to that point. And I learned so much about what I'm capable of, the discipline that I'm capable of having. Um, it did teach me a lot about myself mm -hmm. and it made me love yeah. myself, yeah. you know? I mean, I'm sure you can think about those moments where you're like, I was going to break. And you supported yourself. Like, you know that you can be a champion for yourself. Like, you know that you can get yourself through a dark time. Yeah. Like, anything that's thrown at me now. Yeah. Girl, when you're eating a meal and you're hungry 15 minutes later. Oh, Joe. And you have to wait four more hours. Like. Oh, I used to go to Doug all the time. That sucks. I'd be like, how do you do it? Because <laughs> you're on a whole other level. <laughs> like, yeah. And there were times, like, I do remember one time. I was like, I can't do like to the point where it was like in my st like my stomach was eating my back. <laughs> okay, like my belly button was right in the back, and it was eating. Like it was crazy, and I um, I took a rice cake, just a right nothing on it, ate it, and woke up the next morning and was up like point two five and was crying crying and like <laughs> you destroyed yourself over a 60 calorie yeah. rice cake i was like it's yeah. done i'm never gonna go on stage yeah but then that's when i learned myself I was like you're being so dramatic right now yeah and i annoyed myself yeah and it's like now i know my emotions and i'm like okay well if i know myself and how i act imagine being around other people and doing certain things with so the awareness that bodybuilding gave me fitness yeah. in general but yeah. That moment in my life, I, I enjoy. I enjoy the stage. 
and I'm excited to do it again. Um, it's like I got like a weird like bug or something. Like I'm ready to go. Like I'm like, when's the next one? Yeah, I mean, once you once you do scratch that itch, though, it's like, yeah, some people it's it's becomes their life, and it sounds like yeah. it's going to become yours. A part. Yeah. Yeah, because I never want it to be my identity. Okay. Not my identity. I want it to be a part of my life. You're Fitness be is the, a part of my life. The sneaky competitor. Yeah, like I don't ever want people to be like, is she gonna compete? Like I always like to keep people on, on their toes, but it's just a part of my life. Like I said, I'm new, I'm learning, um, but we'll see. I have mm. aspirations, you know? Well, yeah. you have a bright future ahead because you freaking swept all your classes in show number <laughs> one, so I think it's only gonna get better. Yeah, I hope so, I pray, I pray, but yeah. yeah. All right, girl, we're gonna arm wrestle. Arm wrestle? You oh. have, obviously you didn't make it that far into the episode you watched. I, I mean, I didn't think that we were going to, okay. Why, why would you get dismissed from it? Okay. The power lifter track and field star athlete that you are. Are you, are you going to let me win? <laughs> this is just <laughs> for entertainment. I'm this so competitive. The show. I know, but. Oh, so if you lose, you're going to get. If I lose, I'm just going to be like, listen, we're going to do it again one day. So you're going to come back. I might just like see you, you at Sam's Club. Arm wrestling. Like, Let's go. <laughs> Line up on the belt. <laughs> that would be amazing. Everyone be quiet. I lost it one time. <laughs> Throw down. All right. I'm going to I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. As we do this. All right. This is just for entertainment. Yes. You're going to like stab me in the eyes with your oh nails. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Wait, the grip's like, hold on. Let me. You, you do what you need to do, girl. Okay. Okay. Start when you're ready. Oh, we're, okay. Go ahead. Patrice, mm -hmm. do you have any regrets in life? No. Every, really? Everything that I did in my life, there's a reason. Come on, give me some. I I, I don't want to. I don't want to. You don't want to hurt me. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to go full steam. All right, we're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good sport. <laughs> I should have let you win. Somebody beat me. Not that. Really? I want you to be like, oh my gosh, really? But yeah, someone. Someone unassuming beat me because they are like an expert at arm wrestling technique. <laughs> What's well, like, it's like a whole, there's a like, lot of like, leverage yeah, and like, pulling and hooking and I been, yeah, no. girl, Zach, I talk about him every time we arm mm. wrestle. He's probably sick of hearing it. He came in here and he slammed me down. Really? I was just like, Ooh. it was, it was impressive. No, you definitely, you definitely had me on that one. I'm not a okay. not an arm wrestler. Thumb, I can. I declare war. Oh, you're a thumb wrestler. I, I, I could do that. Here. <laughs> now he's like, I want to try it. <laughs> I have like this, an extra like inch on you though because of my nail. This, like, this will be a first. This will be. Oh yay! I love doing things first. <laughs> All right. All right. One, one two, two, three, four. four. I, I declare, declare a thumb, thumb war. war. I'm gonna punch you in the face. What? The, what do you? you, you Oh, oh! You... That would count. Okay. Does fine. it count? It's fine. No, you, you won. No, you got it. <laughs> Does it count? You gotta start that one though. You never know. I think you just started something new on the show. Spice we have an option up. to arm wrestle or thumb wrestle from now on. Great school. So, Patrice, you said you have no regrets. No. No. And that goes back to our previous conversation, where you said everything happens for a reason, and. Yep. Failure makes you stronger and mm -hmm. right. I don't have any. There's, you know, I'd, if I change something then I might not be where I'm at now. So, you know, I don't regret anything. Maybe when I was younger, I would have said I regret things, but having a little bit more season understanding, talking to more people, I don't regret anything. I love that. I think it says a lot about you too. Oh, thank I you. I mean, not that the people that have regrets, not that it makes them, you know, a weaker person mm -hmm. by any means, but you've owned your mistakes, 100%. your bad decisions, yeah. right? Yeah. Holding yourself accountable. Yeah, because at one point I didn't. So I never want to be that person. Didn't work for me. So yeah. I appreciate the, the old me. That's why I'm here. That's where my new me. So you dropped a nugget on me when we talked the other day. You said that you were going to be nominated for something. Mm. or inspirational I was I yeah. was nominated Oh you were uh -huh. What is it I was nominated um 
one of the most influential influential women in Pittsburgh. How does that make you feel? I mean, <laughs> um, I don't like to take the credit for that, though. It makes me feel great. Sure. You know, I love the fact that somebody or whomever, you know, was on the committee voted for me. But, it, you know, it's there's a lot of people that go into that. And they actually ask me that question. And, and people are like, well, how did you get there? You know, who inspired you? Pittsburgh. Every single person I came in contact with to be influential in a city, you're helping multiple people. You're collaborating with multiple people. So I don't, I don't take it as it's just me. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that got me, got me to that award, and very humble, honored to have it. I would say you're very humble. I just think that people don't recognize how much help it takes when you're doing anything in your life. I just don't like to take credit for something by myself when I know in the back of my mind there's so many people that helped me get there. Yeah. Like, just how I am. I was raised from the very beginning when you talk about my parents. So I was raised. Thank you, parents. Yeah, you, love you did them. good. Love Shishi and Bri. Shishi and Bri. Shishi, it's my mom. <laughs> well, before we close out, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or any questions you have for me? Um, I definitely just want to say at any point in your life, like if you're feeling like you can't do it, like do it anyway. You know, even when it gets hard, don't quit. Um, don't count yourself out. And the ones that count you out, they can't count. You That's know? That's good. They, they can't compare. They can't compete. You know, and I always say that. So um, just don't count yourself out. I want to thank you for, again, allowing me to just, you know, have conversation with you. Um, and my question to you would just be, you know, what is a what is a – a nugget that you've learned or you want to drop on someone about just pushing forward through the storm. Like you said, um, if you don't take a chance, mm -hmm. nothing ever is going to happen to you. Right. Yeah. I'm 45. <laughs> I decided to start a podcast this year. Yes, you did. Right. Yes, you did. Um, it's, it was frightening. It's still scary. Mm hmm. I kind of get nervous before we turn the cameras on just because I want it to be perfect. You mm -hmm. know, this is my brand. Right. This is my home. Right. Um, it's my face. Like I want it to be perfect. Mm. I think that's where the nerves come from. Um, but you got to just press record in life. That's a good one. You Ooh, know, that's a good one. Press record in life. Seriously. Yeah. I like that. Look what's happened. You know, there's been over 30 people sitting in your seat. Mm -hmm. I've had my life changed from every single person, including yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I've changed lives. And I can't tell you how many of my guests reach out to me after their episode airs and say, Sean, my phone has been blowing up about wow. people that watched my episode that were inspired. They didn't know certain things about me. They reached out to apologize for bullying them. Like, you name it. Mm. That's powerful. I had someone, a previous guest, text me this week and said that his dad reached out and apologized to him for mm. being so hard on him. And he was, like, crying to this guy, to his son. Wow. And said... I wish you would have told me this before. Mm -mm. And they said their relationship has c completely changed. That's amazing. In the last month. Wow. So. I love that. Yeah. Um, th the mission is being fulfilled. Every single time someone sits in that seat. And I'm not stopping. You found your purpose. I think so. Mm. Yeah. Claim it. It's claimed. Boom. <laughs> but hey, seriously, girl, thank you so much. Thank you. Friend. Friend. Yes, friend. Yeah. You've been awesome. Um, this wasn't what I expected. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't either. You know, I will have to say, I came in with this like, oh, we're going <laughs> to figure it out. And I I, and I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. I, I hope that in general, we'll continue. I know we will. Yeah. Just to continue to connect and talk and, you know. 
just inspire each other. We're like-minded. Very much. Alignment is important. It and is. that's what yeah. that's what I've learned today. We're very aligned and yeah. very thankful. Sean. And we were strangers two hours ago. Literally. And you know so much about me. Well, everybody. <laughs> everybody. Everybody knows knows majority about my life now. So that's that's great. But yeah. I hope it does. Uh, you know, I hope it changes someone's life it will. or starts a conversation. But I appreciate you. Appreciate you too. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe. Watch one of my previous episodes. Like this video. Comment below. Tell me what you thought about Patrice. Ask questions. How did she help you? Did you resonate with her? And I will see you on the next episode of Barbells and Bourbon. Peace. That was awesome, girl.